What is that sign I see there on the right? Could it possibly be? Well, yes, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Michigan. We're here in the Great Lakes state for the first time. Unless you count that one time we drove to the state line from Elkhart, Indiana, just to take a picture with the sign. Yeah, that doesn't really count now, does it? Over the next few days, we are going to visit the Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore in the Upper Peninsula. We'll eat a local delicacy called a pasty and do a couple of trails in the area. Then we'll take the ferry to Mackinac Island, where motorized vehicles are not allowed, and we'll tour the famous Grand Hotel. After that, we'll cross the Mackinac Bridge into the Mitten part of the state. We'll visit Frankenmuth ever so briefly, and finally the Henry Ford Museum in Detroit. And you know I had to do it, right? I'm gonna go into downtown with a trailer in tow, because that's how we roll. I'm riding, 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 riding in my RV, my RV, wherever I want to be, because I'm free in my RV. Gas seems to be cheaper in Michigan. I didn't see the sign, but I'm sure the GoPro got it. Uh, we just lost an hour. We are in Eastern time now. Check it out. This train here on the side of the road. State Route 35 here hugs the western shore of Lake Michigan for the most part, and eventually we're gonna go straight north towards Lake Superior. Once in a while, we'll see unequivocal signs of the upcoming fall. There it is, Lake Superior! This is called Autrain Beach, at the mouth of the Autrain River, by a town called, let me guess, Autrain. And we're very close to where I intend to spend the night. Here it is, our first view of Lake Superior. Yeah, Lake Superior is like a freshwater ocean in the middle of North America. It was here where I did Minitini the Trailer's five-year anniversary video. Seems like a nice place for it. Let's continue. I have two places in mind where we could potentially spend the night, one is a casino which offers limited electrical hookups, but I have a plan B, just in case. Okay, the town's called Christmas, Michigan. Here's the aforementioned casino on the right, but I'm going to check out our plan B, which is the Bay Furnace Campground, part of the Hiawatha National Forest, but it is primitive. And it is one of those kind of honor system checking deals. And it is very nice, actually. I'm still going to go back and check on my plan A, but plan B is looking better and better, let me tell you. I'm gonna stop here by the day use area real quick. It is such a pleasant afternoon, and we even have a little beach. It's a little too chilly for swimming, though. 
The landmass in front of us is called Grand Island. And uh, the Bay Furnace Ruins, they're supposed to be somewhere around here, but we'll see them tomorrow. Those are called Wood and Williams Islands. Let's go to the casino and see what the situation is, but mm, I think I might be staying here. It is the Kiwadin Christmas Casino, and I like casinos. Not to gamble, but they usually have decent, inexpensive restaurants, and they are usually very RV-friendly. And this one even has hookups, although it looks like all the spaces are taken. You see, if this Itasca would have parked a little to the right or to the left, I might have been able to sneak in, but I guess I'm too late to the party. Yeah, I was... Uh... I was hoping to get on one of those powered sites and I'm sure there are some power outlets uh, unused but these guys, they didn't park in the most efficient of manners. Let me see if I can find something at the campground still. Because so I see people going in. Those places kind of honor system where you fill out a form, write them a check. So I'm just gonna put the check in the in the in the mailbox up there at the entrance and you know stay the night. 20 bucks, you know, primitive, of course. Seems very quiet. And it's very, it's kind of chilly actually. I'm gonna put my, my hoodie on now and I'm gonna go all the way to the lake. Maybe we can see the, the sunset too. And the trick with this, you know, you just go, you know, search the campground. And if it does have a tag that says reserved, just make sure it's not for today. And uh, you can camp there. You see, this one is reserved for the fifth. So today's the, the second. So I should be okay. Oh, there is lake access. Let's check it out. And that airstream got a pretty nice sight, huh? And this is the same day use area from earlier. Let me tell you, pretty chilly. It's what, 55 degrees, 56 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's gonna go down into the low 50s tonight. And don't be fooled by this beautiful weather here. It's, it's going to rain overnight and, and tomorrow may not be such a great weather day, but at least we get to enjoy today, right? Live for the moment, live for the present. And the present is beautiful. I got a pretty good sight too. It is time for another RV cooking show coming to you today from the shores of Lake Superior here in, in Michigan. And we're gonna do some um, some penne rigate with meatballs. I finally found in, in, in Milwaukee of all places that uh, golden cooking wine that I use. This one is white cooking wine, but it should be the same. Uh, so yeah, it's, that's one of my signature ingredients. So this is gonna come out really good. And I'm running low in, in olive oil, so we're gonna uh, fry some uh, some bacon to, to use the the bacon fat for this. I'm gonna start heating up the water for the pasta. Hmm, some mushrooms. I've never tried it before. It's a seasoning blend. It comes with onion, celery, green peppers, red peppers, and parsley. And I have high hopes. Oh yeah. I have some IPAs, but they're warm, so that's not good. Stick them in the 
freezer here. Oh yeah, it's starting, you see, starting to look beautiful. There goes my signature ingredient. Lots of garlic powder because I'm out of the real thing. Uh, paprika, oregano, cumin, lots of cumin. I love, I love the taste of cumin, especially combined with that cooking wine. Basil because why not? There, frozen meatballs. I really like this tomato sauce by Michaels of Brooklyn. It's a homestyle gravy. And it's not very heavy at all. That's why I like it. Oh, you know what? We haven't added to this. Salt and pepper. What's wrong with me? It rained most of the night and it might still rain a little more today, but I think it's gonna let up. Today we're going to the to the Pictured Rocks uh, National Lakeshore and uh, that should be interesting. It's supposed to be one of the top places to see here in the Upper Peninsula. And then we're going to St. Ignis, it's called. Let's go see the lake one more time. Let's get on the road. Did I forget anything? Well, yeah, we forgot to see the bay furnace. Another time. This was a nice campground, and it still is, even on this rainy, gloomy morning. And unfortunately, it looks like it's going to be like this or worse for the rest of the day, so I'll be monitoring the weather. This is Munising, the gateway to the Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore. And from here, you can take boat tours and do all kinds of activities. But all I want to do really is explore a little bit, maybe do a couple of hikes. And right now, the priority is breakfast. I'm starving. And I've seen a couple of places advertising something called a pasty. And I think someone recommended I eat that. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to park right here. Never mind the fact that I'm illegally parked, but I had to try this uh, local delicacy called a pasty. I know, it's actually pronounced pasty. I know that now. It's kind of like a savory, oops, pastry. There you go. Mmm. Kind of like a in them, you know, has carrots and um, I think it was meat, carrots and uh, potatoes and um, onions. And it's actually good breakfast food. Hmm. Let's continue. That pasty was a meal all unto itself. It's kind of similar to an empanada, but much larger and it's uh, has more stuff in it. I really liked it. In any case, as I was eating, I looked it up on the Wikipedia, <clears throat> and apparently it, 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 its origins are from Cornwall, England. 
and migrants brought it over to the United States and several other places around the world, like Australia and uh, northern Wisconsin. And here, the Upper Peninsula, it's one of the it's one of the signature delicacies of this area. I want to pass by the visitor center to find out what are the best things to do, you know, given the allotted time and the fact that I'm towing a trailer. Uh-oh, road closed. I always get nervous when I have to go through these more residential streets. You never know when you're gonna find a dead end. Here we are, and there's oversized vehicle parking. Well, the lady in there spent uh, almost half an hour explaining everything to me, but now I know exactly uh, everything there is uh, to see in the park. Within the four or five hours that I really have, let's, let's face it, I don't have all that much time. But let's try to see as much as possible. And I've said it before and I'll say it once again. One of the best things about the National Park Service are really the rangers. They're so knowledgeable and, and so helpful. And you can tell that they love their job and they love the, the area where they work. And this lady, you can tell she's lived here all her life and she knows every nook and cranny of this, of this national park. You know what, I've been ignoring this for too long, but um, yeah, it's been beeping. It's 45, which is not the end of the world, but let's, uh, let's fill up our tires. <sighs> This thing, by the way, an RVers must have. Our first stop here and combining whatever she wrote on the map together with my Google Maps, and I'm downloading offline maps for this area, by the way. Uh, our first stop is going to be uh, these waterfalls called Wagner Falls, which are outside the park, but she said that they're one of her favorites. So let's go see that. We've got more bad weather coming up, and uh, here we are. Wagner Falls Scenic Site. I think I can park here to the right. Here we go. It's beautiful out here and it's supposed to be a short hike. I mean, I can already hear the water. It's like a tenth of a mile. And it's kind of paved, so it's, it's an easy hike. I think it's even ADA compliant. This is a good start, good start to our day here. Now let's go inside the park. Did you say national park, but it's a national national lakeshore. Still part of the national park system. And they didn't ask for my annual pass, so I guess it is free to get into all these places. We'll, we'll see, we'll see. Well, this is technically not part of the national park yet. And as you can see, some trees are starting to get the memo that fall is upon us. And the sun's coming out. That was a cool short stop, let's continue! Here's the plan, we're gonna go into the park and first we're going to visit the Miner's Castle area. There we go, fall colors once again. Alright, let's go to the Overlook first. And this is all part of the North Country Trail. Did you say trail that goes, uh, you know, east to west throughout the United States? 
It's gorgeous. <laughs> there it is. Miner's Castle. Well, what's left of it? This one fell to the ocean a few years ago. Yeah, apparently the best way to see the cliffs is from a boat. We're gonna have to do that next time. But let me tell you, this is not such a bad view. And I love the colors on the water too. Let's go to the lower overlook, which this is not it. Well, the North Country Trail continues that way, but we're looking, we're going to the, to the lower overlook here. By the way, that North Country Trail is a, is a long hike, you know, like uh, similar, I guess, to the Appalachian Trail or the Pacific Crest or, or the Continental Divide Trail. And it goes west, I think it starts in Maine and it goes all the way to Nebraska or something like that. More research shall go into this because at some point I would like to do at least sections of some of these trails. The AT for sure. We might do a section of the AT as part of this trip. Very short section. Time permitting, of course. We're almost there. And this is old sandstone, by the way. All this is sandstone, uh, rock formations here. And, ooh, check it out, we're right here. And I can only imagine how much better it, it was when the second tower was here. Or here, was it? No, it was there. Still, very beautiful. Yeah, next time we come, we definitely have to take a boat tour. Even on this uh, somewhat gloomy, overcast day here. here. On the other side, well, it's Lake Superior. And now we're gonna continue towards that area. And the name Miners it comes because I do believe it was first found by miners who thought that because of the coloration of the rocks there might be some minerals in the area which uh, turned out not to be true but uh, they still kept the name of Miners uh, Rocks and uh, Miners Beach coming up now. Yeah, let's go to Miners Beach. I always seem to get myself into these types of dead-end situations with the trailer in tow. Hmm, I don't know what it is. Hmm, perhaps I should have brought the banana boat. Here we are, Miner's Beach. Just someone is getting some bonfire ready there. Is it? Here we see some contemporary petroglyphs on the rocks, perhaps in an otherwise idyllic place. Can you imagine this with nice weather? There's a tiny little waterfall. Yeah, that's Elliot's Falls. The park ranger mentioned it. Carve your name on the rock. Shouldn't be a thing, but it is. Look at all these layers. What does it remind you of? Kind of, sort of. It is very pretty out here. This area, it does remind me a little bit of Maine in a way, don't you think? I mean, each area is different, has its own thing, but you can't help but compare, right? Let's go to the west end of the beach. It is a very short hike to the lake. Mm. 
There it is. That's the boat we should have taken. I mean, this is not a bad view, but I've read it is so much better from the boat. If I hadn't tasted the water earlier, I would have really thought this could be an ocean with waves and tides. We've got one more point of interest in this area and it is Miner's Falls. It is through this unpaved road and it is starting to rain. It said limited turnaround and maximum, maximum length of 32 feet, which I'm around 32 feet in length in total. Oh, this is not bad at all. I thought I was going to encounter another dead end. Now, if only this class A would leave. And it did. I found this, this uh, latest rain poncho <laughs> among my supplies and, you know, it's not bad. It, it'll get the job done. How do I know it's a latest one? Because of the way the buttons are, you know. I don't know who came up with that, but... Yeah, why is that, huh? This is Miner's Falls, half a mile. Let's do it. Let's be honest, it's not the greatest poncho in the world. It came, it came free with one of those uh, free like, survival kits <laughs> that I received a couple of years ago. And uh, I mean, it does protect some, but... It's getting really dark in this area. But we've, we've got a... We've got a big rain cloud on top of us. Yeah, raining pretty hard, actually. Okay. I guess this is a fork on the road, I guess. You can see something from this, just a point up here. Oh, there you go. Pretty cool. I don't know if it was worth the rainy hike, but it's pretty cool. All right, let's go back. Yeah, this this poncho is barely adequate. I gotta give me a good rain poncho, or maybe I should have brought the umbrella. On the other hand, very well maintained trail here. It's raining pretty hard, believe it or not. We don't feel it because we are under all this canopy of of trees, but it's raining pretty hard. And uh, as I was saying, very well maintained trail here, very easy to hike. It's really coming down. Oh my gosh. Raindrops keep falling on my head or on my cape. In this case, actually. Let me get my repel umbrella. It's letting up a little bit and there's really not much more to do here, so let's continue. Oh no, it's still raining pretty hard. Uh, let's, let's just say there won't be a trailer cam for this portion of the trip because the trailer cam right now is not necessarily waterproof. I did put a little bit of this covering the USB ports and covering this and I could put it up there without the power bank, but I have no idea where I put the, the little door that goes here to cover the USB and the, and the HDMI. So for now, we're stuck with the Sony, which is not bad because 
at least you know you can see through the wipers we got a 45 minute drive to our next uh, destination actually let me look let me look at the at the paper map real quick just in case make sure we're not missing anything in this area that's it that's all there is in this area and now let's go to 12 mile beach well, yes, that's the plan. We're gonna skip this whole green area here to the left, which is mostly steep unpaved roads and hiking trails that would actually take a few days to explore properly. We're just gonna stop by the Lake Superior Overlook and then focus on the Grand Sable Dunes area and Sable Falls. Not a fun drive, that's for sure. Here we are, Lake Superior Overlook. I'm going to reheat some of that pasta I cooked yesterday. Mm, I'm hungry. Hiking in the rain. I'm hiking in the rain. I'm not really hiking, I'm just going to this vista point. You can see Lake Superior. There's another little trail that goes down to the beach. I might take that one too. Yeah, the weather does not want to cooperate. Use this boot brush before and after your hike to remove dirt and invasive seeds. Can I get a shoe shine too? <laughs> Very pretty. Well, it kind of stopped raining. So. It's kind of windy, so it's not as effective with the umbrella when it's kind of windy. It's like a, like a small river here. Coming down. Like a creek. I wonder if this is because of the rain or if it is... Uh, permanent it's probably permanent right it is actually called Sullivan Creek not the best weather here for sightseeing let me tell you let's go back up it's starting to rain harder now Woo. if it doesn't stop raining I'm not gonna do any more hikings or sightseeing because oh wow it's really coming down Let's stop right here by Grand Sable Lake. Oh, this is a Sable Lake. And if you can see on the other side, there are incipient hints of fall colors. I don't know if a camera can capture it. If it's just a figment of my imagination. There. That one is more visible, right there. There's one precocious tree there. Well, bad weather is passing through, so I think I'm going to put the trailer cam back on the roof. Well, yes, this was Grand Sable Lake, and now we're going to see Sable Falls. This here to the left is the Grand Sable Visitor Center. And here we are, this is the trailhead. Sable Falls, 500 feet, and the Grand Sable Dunes are there too, so let's go on. The North Country Trail goes through here too. It's gonna be 168 stair steps down to Sable Falls. Let's see the falls and then we'll see the dunes. Let's see the falls first. Mm -hmm. 
That seems like a dangerous activity, especially under these wet and slippery conditions, but hey. In any case, here we are, here we go, Grand Sable Falls. There's a lower observation platform, so let's go there. Hmm, someone forgot their water shoes. In any case, here we are at the lower platform, overlooking Grand Sable Falls. It appears there's yet another platform. Here we are. Now, let's go see the sand dunes. Half a mile that way. Might as well, we came this far, right? <laughs> it's all very green and beautiful, even though I don't feel all that comfortable in the woods. But this, I like. Beautiful out here. Here we are, transitioning from the forest to the sand dunes. And apparently this particular type of sand dune here is pretty rare because it is on a plateau. At least that's what they told me at the visitor center. And uh, Apparently it was deposited here many, many years ago by a glacier, you know, during the last uh, ice age. And uh, oh, look at that, beautiful. Yep, we've reached the lake. I think this is as far as I want to go. Beautiful view from up here. Lake Superior. I'm gonna start heading back. Yeah, this was definitely worth the hike. Oh, heading back. Look at that. How beautiful. Well, time's up, at least in the UP. I have, a, I have a reservation at Straits State Park, which is uh, down in St. Ignace. Well, actually, St. Ignace is still technically in the UP, so enjoy the ride. Yep, fall's coming. Just like that, the sun came out, and cloudy again, and rainy again. This will be a good test of my poor man's waterproofing of the GoPro and the power bank. And I've reached the shores of Lake Michigan once again. The North Shore this time. And the sun came out again. Hmm. Peculiar weather, I'm telling you. Scenic overlook. Let's stop. Check out the scenic overlook. Oh, 
Oh wow, yeah, that's nice. Here we are, Straight State Park in St. Ignace. Here we are, this is my campsite, 166. I don't know if I was supposed to park it like this, but I have so much room that I decided to, to do like a pull through kind of thing. This is only electrical here, no water or sewer. But I have a pretty large area here and uh, I might not even unhitch if I find out that uh, everything I need is walking distance I might not even unhitch well as it turns out the town and the terminal are a little farther than I thought and not the most pedestrian friendly road so I'm gonna have to unhitch after all I'm gonna hike to some of the Mackinac Island bridge overlooks which afford shall I say commanding views Well, good morning from St. Ignace, Michigan. Well, today we are actually doing something we cannot do with an RV, and that is go to Mackinac Island. Only bicycles and horse-drawn carriages allowed. They do make an exception for emergency vehicles and snowmobiles, but that's it. I'm gonna try and get on the 10 a.m. ferry, which makes a scenic pass under the Mackinac Bridge. Here we are. I went, to, I went to the terminal, got my ticket, and they have this uh, parking lot here across the street where you can park for free. It's pretty full. As you can see, it's a perfect weather day here this morning. Yeah, that's where you buy your tickets, and this is the boarding area right here. And here we wait. There comes our ride, I think. Never mind, this one is our ride. Let's go upstairs. Okay, here we go, anchors away. There's the Wawatam Lighthouse. And there it is, the lighthouse again, as we circumvent St. Ignace, going towards the Strait of Mackinac. What do we see there in the background? Wait for it! Wait for it! There it is! The Great Machina Bridge! And we're gonna go right under it. And tomorrow we'll go over it, but not yet. All in due time. This is the very spot where two of the Great Lakes, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, are joined. At this relatively narrow stretch of water here, which also separates Michigan's upper and lower peninsulas. It is a huge bridge. This will give you a sense of scale. We're about to go under it now. It first opened in 1957, locally known as the Big Mac or the Mighty Mac. It is almost five miles long and quite an impressive sight to see it in person. Can't wait to drive over it tomorrow since I've heard that it's an experience as well. And that's it. We're going to circle back around towards Mackinac Island. 
Notice the center two lanes are an open grid. It was made like that to allow vertical airflow and increase the stability in high winds, which can be a problem for suspension bridges. Now onto Makina Island. And there it is, the Pièce de Résistance, the famous Grand Hotel. And check out all these beautiful Victorian mansions. Ever since I saw the movie Somewhere in Time, sometime in the early 80s, I've wanted to come here and see what has to be the epitome of opulence and luxury when it comes to hotels. Of course, you have to take that mandatory picture the first time you come, right? And this is one of those places which is so picturesque that we'll be hard-pressed to take a bad picture here, especially on such a gorgeous day. Here we are! We made it! So exciting! Let's just walk around a little bit, get our bearings, the lay of the land, admire the gorgeous wooden structures. Here's the welcoming committee, all these geese here having breakfast. There's no denying it. This might be the most charming town we've ever been to. Aside from a few modern anachronisms, you would think we've been transported somewhere else in time, let's say the late 19th century. A local ordinance dating back to 1898 prohibits the use of motor vehicles on the island, with very few exceptions, one of them being golf carts. Only at the golf course, though. As I said, it is nearly impossible to take a bad picture here. Here's the public transportation. The Grand Hotel does offer a shuttle with a very stern-looking coachman. And this is the main drag, where all the shops are, many of them, selling fudge and all kinds of sweet treats. Lots and lots of uh, fudge shops here on the island. This one, go ones. And all these places make fudge on cold marble slabs, which happens to be the traditional manner. And I haven't had breakfast. And all these smells are driving me crazy. Okay, I'm just gonna have some fudge for breakfast. This Murdoch's place here comes very highly recommended. They've been around since 1887. <laughs> By the way, that fudge only whet my appetite for some real food. And someone recommended a place called Round Island Bar and Grill, so that's where I'm going. Is it possible for a place to be too picturesque? 
If it is possible, Mackinac Island definitely qualifies as that. I mean, everywhere you look, it's worth pointing the camera. I'm gonna run out of camera battery because it's like, everywhere you look, it's somewhere where you would like to point to the camera and, uh, and take a picture. All this, all this beautiful Victorian uh, uh, architecture. And, um, and yeah, and we, we're getting such perfect weather this morning. Here's St. Anne's Catholic Church, which I believe they are celebrating Mass right now, so we'll be back. I just realized they're in the middle of Mass, so I didn't want to go inside. Though. I'll go back. I'll, I'll come back on the way back. St. Anne's Church from 1874. It appears lawn mowers are also allowed on the island. I'm going to a restaurant here. Not, not of the beaten path. Nothing on this island, I think, is, is of the beaten path, but it's was recommended by, by a viewer, by one of you guys. Here's another historic building. This is called the Mission Church. 1829 through 1830. It doesn't look like they're holding service, so let's go inside. It is rather plain, which might be the whole point, and it has the historical significance of being the oldest surviving church building in Michigan. It is very austere. Let's continue. And here's another one of those impossibly picturesque houses. This one a luxury condo, although I believe some units may be available for rent seasonally, if you're interested. We're approaching this area called Mission Point, where French Jesuit missionaries landed in 1634, less than two decades after Plymouth Rock. And of course, here's the immaculately landscaped Mission Point Resort. The sculpture is called Rich and Splash by sculptor Andy Saxtoder. Yep, that's the life. All of this, by the way, part of that Mission Point Resort. And there it is, the aforementioned Round Island Bar. Let's go in. I think the entrance is from inside the resort. And can you believe these gardens? Very, very impressive. There's no one here. Let's go somewhere else because there's really no one there. And I don't want to eat by myself at the bar, so. <laughs> and yeah, they say hello, they say good morning, but nobody really came to, <laughs> to take my order, so let's go somewhere else. You know, timing is everything. Maybe it gets busier later in the day. Maybe I'll come back, but <laughs> right now, just before noon, it's. Not happening. <laughs> Look at this. This is like such such an incredible place. I'm gonna go to the next bar, grill there, and if there's nothing going on in that one either, I'll just go back to downtown and eat at one of the touristy places. Actually, I'm gonna go a little further down the street. There's supposed to be an arch rock, and then we'll go back. It truly is picture perfect. A 
And here we are, Mackinac Island State Park. And I still find it kind of unfathomable that this is a lake and not the actual ocean. My mind does not compute. I believe we have to go up these stairs. Yep, stairway to Arch Rock. Here goes nothing. And there it is. It's like a natural bridge, or limestone arch, rather. Here they have like an observation deck. Beautiful views of the lake from up here. All right, let's go get something to eat. Let's head back to town. Hmm, what is this? It is called Dwightwood Spring. It's supposed to be a historic landmark, and according to the website, the most famous of the natural flows of clear, cold water that dot the island. And according to the sign, unsafe to drink. check out this place here see if, uh, if it's any good and if it's not good then there's like a gazillion places downtown it's called the bistro on the greens well, the bar seems really nice but there's a bunch of bees as you may or may not know i'm afraid of bees and cockroaches but mainly bees and this bar was a bunch of bees just flying around they couldn't do it it seemed nice though i kid you not there were bees everywhere. I'm sure we'll find something downtown. And I've been hungry for so long that I don't even feel all that hungry anymore. Ooh, let's go into the church. Well, hopefully mass is over by now. Here we are, St. Anne Church. And now that Mass is over, we can roam around freely. This church, by the way, was dismantled from its original location in Micheli Machina, in modern-day Machina City, and moved here from 1780 to 1781. Let's walk back to downtown, here on Lakeshore Boulevard. The island house here is the oldest hotel on the island. Here's a small replica of the Statue of Liberty, one of 200 placed in 39 states around the country by the Boy Scouts of America. Exquisite landscaping everywhere. Hmm, America's oldest grocery store. This is uh, Mary's Bistro Draft House. I'm gonna start with an upper hand IPA. We're getting the fish and chips here. I was pleasantly surprised by this place, which seemed to be like the most touristy one right next to the, to the dock. And, uh, good beer, good fish and chips. Now let's go to the Grand Hotel.
This is gorgeous, but I don't think it is through here. I don't live here, so I should probably keep my opinions to myself. But I don't entirely get this no motorized vehicles thing. Like, you know, <laughs> it's fine. They want to leave in the Victorian era for touristy reasons, but still, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just I'm not going to say anything else about it. But. Sometimes it doesn't smell very good, you know? I know it is charming and it certainly evokes that traveling back in time theme immortalized by the movie with Christopher Reeves and Jane Seymour, which I might add, they couldn't possibly have chosen a more appropriate location. Well, there it is, the iconic Grand Hotel here in Mackinac Island. And uh, they, they want $10 to go in. I don't know if I'm going to do it or not. Not yet. Keep going. Keep going. I'll go as close as I can. And then if they start charging me, well, I, I might pay it. You know, I'm here. And uh, yeah. They do have a strict dress code, especially after 6 p.m. Well, yeah, they do charge you $10 to, to go past those two ladies there, coming this way. And I'm like, all right, might as well, I'm here, you know. Let's see the inside. Hello, horse. With your $10, they include a map of the property, kind of like a self-guided tour with the main points of interest. This is the Audubon wine bar, and I was tempted, but I'm gonna save the one drink I'm gonna have here for someplace else. This is the terrace room, which is like the main ballroom, with music and entertainment at night. And I can imagine all the guests at night, garbed in their most dapper fashions. Let's take the elevator up to the Coppola Bar. Here we are. Beautiful views from the highest point in the hotel and a nice glass of bubbly to celebrate we're here. To go. Let's see the lower level here real quick and they do have a bar. This might have been a better choice. Anyway, it's time to go back down.
I think we can scratch this one off of the bucket list. Although one day I'd like to come back with Ely and enjoy a glass of champagne or some other refreshing beverage here at the front porch with all these other fine people. They claim it is the world's largest front porch, 660 feet long. And here's a view of Lake Huron with a carriage coming down the street. It is certainly impressive, the front porch. And starting at $450 per night, quickly climbing all the way to a thousand, staying here would definitely be a luxury. Which makes the berry berry drink special for $16.50 seem like a bargain. Actually, if you think about it, I paid a mere $10 just for the privilege of seeing the place. And there's the historic Round Island Passage Light. Yep, the largest front porch in the world. And you can even play chess. Hmm, the two young ladies that charged me the $10 are gone. It is iconic, for sure. Let's go down to the gardens. Yeah, very nice. Here they have this small fountain with a great view of the majestic hotel. And there, on the top, that's the Coppola Bar, where I had my celebratory bubbly earlier today. Very nice. This is the swimming pool, but this is as close as I'm gonna get. There's a trail that goes to the lake, to Lakeshore Drive. Maybe I could have snuck in this way, instead of using the main entrance. Post office delivers here. One more thing to see. Let's go see Fort Mackinac. And then we're taking the ferry back. There it is, on top of the hill. Fort Mackinac. This is called the Missionary Bark Chapel here. Let's see what it is. Apparently, chapels like this one were built by French Jesuit missionaries to convert the Indians of the Great Lakes. Such nice views from up here. And we're only gonna get higher. Uh, it is $13.50 to visit the fort. And if I paid 10 bucks to see the hotel, might as well pay 1350 to see the historical fort, right? Ah. We have one hour left here on the island, more or less. The history of all the ferry lines that have serviced the island. That's a pretty steep. There comes the 330 boat. <sighs> that was a long way up. And they do have reenactments here, and sometimes they even fire a cannon, but I have no idea what the schedule is. I'd say that's a commanding view, for sure. Hmm, they are showing a movie here. Wealthy Midwesterners built palatial summer homes in keeping with the new standards set by Grand Hotel. Well, let's explore a little bit. 
As I said, I want to leave on the 4.30 boat, so I have a little less than an hour to see the fort. Check it out, an old stereoscopic device. It is the arch. This was the quartermaster storehouse. And this, hmm, let me guess. What would happen if I pull on this rope? Hey, check it out! Not bad. Not bad at all. Is that Morse code I hear? North Blockhouse. Let me tell you, I really like seeing these things, you know, how life and furniture has changed and evolved over the years, how many things are now different, while others remain very similar. It looks like the officers led a very comfortable life here. to do a double take. That's a cool weather vane. We can even see the Grand Hotel from up here. Here's a tea room with a view and a holographic doctor, sort of. I discovered a fluctuation in the tumor and opened it. So that's how they used to look originally. We have a bar and lunch room and a billiard room. And even though we didn't get to experience the firing of the cannon, this was a cool visit, if only for the views. And the fitting end to our time here. Back in our island. Well, that was the fort in a nutshell. Uh, your your admission ticket it does uh, it is valid for two days. So tomorrow I could have come once again. I wanted to stay for I don't know where the fire when they fire boom the, the the big cannon. I've heard it three times already since I've been here on the island. But I'm tired. I'm just gonna go buy some fudge. As I said, I'm gonna buy some fudge here. I have to take some as gifts. And I'm gonna get some for myself too, because that's what you do, right? Very cool to see them make it in the traditional way. Whoops. That's some fudge, because that's what you do. Back to the mainland we go. The other ferry, by the way, sails to and from Mackinac City on the Lower Peninsula.
one final look at the Grand Hotel as we sail across this England freshwater ocean. That's what it feels like. It is pretty choppy. I got off at the wrong dock, but in any case, that gives, gives me a chance to walk the town a little bit. Yeah, it turns out that first stop was for the people who work on the island. Us tourists, we were supposed to get off at the next stop, dock 3, but I'm not in a hurry. It is less than a mile and uh, I don't mind walking and getting to know St. Ignace a little better. I was gonna get something to eat in town, but I have some burgers in Minitini in the trailer. So that's what I'm going to do. Bon appétit. Pretty good. How about we go for a hike? Ooh, check it out. This is a nice angle. We'll be driving over it tomorrow towards the lower peninsula. Here's a different view. And by the way, there is another campground down here with hookups. And with that, we say goodbye for now to Michigan's upper peninsula. Tomorrow we continue south towards the Lower Peninsula. It is going to be $8 to cross the Mackinac Bridge with my four axles, which is actually not so bad. I've definitely seen worse. Mackinac Island. Right yes! Driving on the Big Mac towards the Lower Peninsula. So exciting! Well, we are now officially in the Lower Peninsula, Mackinac City. I know what you're gonna say. Robert, you're missing all the good parts. And yeah, I know. They were all part of my original plan, trust me. But plans change. As I said, I'm on a tight schedule here, so we're gonna stop more or less halfway down the mitten in Frankenmuth. And my timing, impeccable as ever. We're here during the annual Autofest, which is a classic car show. So the town is packed, but I called an RV park and they said they could fit me in. This is the St. Lawrence Church Grove Campground. Part of the German Lutheran church of the same name brought here in 1845 by the original settlers of the town, who happened to be from Bavaria. Even though they were super busy with the car show, he said they would find me a site. And they did. This is one of the most welcoming and accommodating group of people I have ever encountered in my travels. Alright, let's go have lunch. Everybody's super nice uh, here at this uh, campground, it belongs to a church. 
Let's go to Zenders. Its legendary fried chicken is supposed to be the best in Michigan. And you know I'm a fried chicken kind of guy. Yep, all kinds of classic cars. It's quite picturesque actually, the town. I might walk this whole area afterwards. Hmm, listen to that exhaust note. Take the next right, then your destination will be on the left. Alright, this is it. By the way, this Zenders is nowadays like a whole empire here. They have a marketplace, a hotel, a water park, even a golf course. Alright, looks promising. I'm sure I love the car. Actually, I can smell. I can smell it. Mm. Here in this waiting area they have this mural, one of five actually. This one recognizes the early lumbering industry of the Saginaw Valley. Bread, coleslaw, looks good. <clears throat> Onion soup. I got a beer flight because that's how I roll. And here's the famous fried chicken. Life-changing experience I was hoping for, but it wasn't bad. Service was great. The mashed potatoes. Were really, good. really cool to see all of these classic cars. And even though I'm not going to be able to enjoy Frankenmuth here in its normal state, it seems nice. It is an honest, authentic German town with the right amount of touristy, great service everywhere. Okay, perhaps a little too touristy. But I think they're doing it right. Hmm, making fudge the traditional way. Listen to the music. It's very touristy, very touristy. That fudge smells delicious though. Oh yeah, cheese house. Let me tell you, I really wish I was still hungry. Hmm, cute. I'm gonna start heading back to the car. Just walked a couple of blocks here on the strip. It kind of reminds me of Helen a little bit in a way. It is the, the Bavaria of Michigan, the, of the meeting. Uh, this, this place would have been nice. Frost wine bar and charcuterie. Seems to have a nice ambience. And you know I'm a wine kind of guy, so I was gonna st stick the camera in there, but, but the hostess was right there looking at me. I'm like, okay. <laughs> And this seems to be like the main drag here. Yeah, very nice, very picturesque uh, town here. Frankenmuth. Coffee house, maybe they have espresso, you think? Oh yeah, I could use an espresso right now. After that lunch. Yep, this is exactly what I need. Oh well. This is the Gonsenhausen Platz Fountain, unveiled in 2012. And they came by the brewery, but the parking lot seems to be repurposed for some car fest activity. Okay, I almost forgot about the other great tourist attraction here in town is the Christmas store, Bonner's Christmas store, so we're gonna go there. Brewery, as you saw, the parking lot is blocked off because you know they, 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 they're get, everybody here is getting ready for tomorrow for the for the car show. So the, this whole town is in function of that. So behind me, you can see the Holzbruck, which is German for wooden bridge. And there is really so much to see in this part of town. But you know, today is gonna be crazy with the auto show starting tomorrow, and I really have to continue going south first thing in the morning. And if I wasn't going to to Ohio tomorrow. Maybe I would have stayed for the car show, but nah, not really. And here we are. And wow, this place is insanely huge. Believe it or not, it kind of reminds me of North Pole, Alaska, or Rovaniemi, Finland, which are perhaps the two other places I've been to that have like an over-the-top Christmas theme. Although I think 
This one wins the first place. Baby Jesus. Okay, let's step inside. Yeah, over the top doesn't even begin to describe it. It is one of those places that if you can't find it here, it probably doesn't exist. Here's a little bit of a travel section, but I haven't seen anything RV related yet. Lots of different themes though. Here we have the Mexican section. I like the music section, very cool with all these little instruments. Let's check out some Christmas trees, shall we? And here's the patriotic section. Very cool. All kinds of little vehicles, but no RVs. Oh, it is quite a collection of Christmas ornaments they have in there. Okay, let's go back into town. And I think this is all we're gonna do here in Frankenmuth today. And I know. I'm not doing the town any justice now, am I? But such is travel. Sometimes you have the time to linger, sometimes you don't. And besides, with car fest going on, it is gonna be crazy around here tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to turn in relatively early today. You know, get some work done and then relax, organize my files in the computer and that kind of thing. Because I have a feeling the next three days are going to be action-packed. Well, yes, for the next couple of days I'm gonna be hanging out with our friends the Forries from Ohio. And I'm sure he has a full schedule planned to show me part of the Buckeye State. We are even gonna have a meetup in Columbus, the state capital. That's gonna be a lot of fun. Like a party, you know? But all in due time. First, we have to get there. By the way, this is uh, my campsite here at the St. Lawrence uh, Church. I had to run a really, really long cable. And they lend me a piece of cable to, to plug into that. Uh, it's a 20, 20 amp outlet, but I'm not gonna need the AC here, so it's gonna be fine. Beautiful grounds here in, in Frankenmuth. Well, good morning. Hmm, the dump station doesn't seem to be in the most convenient of places. Or perhaps it is me. Perhaps I am the one going the wrong way. <laughs> in any case, I don't really need to dump yet. The GPS is taking me through all these back roads and residential neighborhoods on our way back to I-75. And yes, we're going to Detroit, and then off to Ohio. We've got reservations at East Harbor State Park, which is located in an area which is also colloquially known as Vacation Land. For good reason, as you will soon find out. But first, we are so close. We have to check out Detroit real quick, right? I think we've made it, and we're only gonna do one thing here, and that is the Henry Ford Museum. And I've often said, you know, I'm not a museum kind of person, for the most part, but this one I want to see. This is my kind of museum.
There's also Greenfield Village, which is supposed to be a must-see, but we don't really have the time today. We're just gonna do the museum, so let me get the tickets. It was uh, $30 in total just for the Henry Ford uh, Museum of Innovation, which is uh, really all I have time for. <laughs> it was 24 plus parking. This first section is dedicated to presidential vehicles. And what have we got here? Teddy Roosevelt's 1902 Braham. Very stylish. This is FDR's 1939 Lincoln. Now, that's an imposing vehicle. Well, check it out! Eisenhower's Bubble Top 1950 Lincoln. Who knew, huh? Mr. Dwight? Cruising in style in his convertible. That's a pretty mean looking face, too. Here's the 1961 Lincoln, in which President Kennedy was assassinated in November 1963. And finally, here's Ronald Reagan's 1972 Lincoln. Doesn't it seem odd for a president to use a 10-year-old car, but hey. And of course, after Kennedy's assassination, all these were made fully armored with bulletproof glass. Although Reagan did have a sunroof for him and Nancy to come out and wave. Here we have two very different vehicles. On the right, a 1959 Cadillac. On the left, self-driving Chevrolet. There's a Studebaker. I really like that look with the wraparound rear window and the iconic airplane propeller spinner design. By the way, the museum is not only about cars, it even features classic neon signs. Now, here's one of my favorite vehicles of all time a 1956 Chevrolet Bel Air. How cool would it be to take one of this for a spin? Hmm, maybe I'll have lunch here later. This museum, by the way, there's enough here to spend the whole day and more. I don't think I've ever seen so many antique vehicles under one roof. Uh, and all the exhibits with the historical context. The entire history of the American automobile before our very eyes. Do you know what that is? That's the 1932 Ford V8 engine. It was light, powerful and inexpensive, which made all the difference. Here we have some imports, like the Toyota Corona back there, and these compact vehicles became more popular in the 70s during the oil crisis. Notice the photo in the back from when they reduced the speed limit to 55 miles per hour nationwide. Hmm, Dodge Omni. Illy used to have one of those. The Ford Explorer. The Honda Accord. The Dodge Ram and the Toyota Prius, all vehicles that pretty much defined a new category at the time. I'm gonna take a break and visit the diner, which is very cool by the way. I'm just gonna have something light, nothing too fancy, just a clam chowder and a chicken salad sandwich. It was a cool experience. Let's start by the beginning. Yeah, this place is so big that it is very easy to get disoriented, so I'm just gonna start at the beginning and work my way to the other side. Check out the old Texaco gas station. And it is not only about cars, of course. The museum is about all kinds of innovations, 
like hotels, for example, and the invention of chain lodging. Apparently, Holiday Inn was one of the early innovators. It is a small section, but they do have an, an RV section here, camper vans, an airstream, and, uh, and it's called a uh, tent trailer. Well, I'm glad they have a small section dedicated to what we do. What do they call this one? Auto camping in style. Here we go. This is more like it. Vacation homes on wheels. I guess this would be the precursor to the pop-up trailer. It goes on and on. Here we go, steam locomotives. I actually like this a lot. I mean, look at the size of this thing. This is the 1941 Allegheny, and it represents the peak of steam technology. One of the largest and most powerful steam locomotives ever built, 7,500 horsepower. It is just beautiful. One can't help but feel small standing next to it. From this beast, we go to the Duet Clinton, one of the first locomotives dating back to 1831. Ooh, we can go inside the Allegheny. It's kind of dark in here. Here's the Rogers locomotive, which is actually beautiful and so emblematic in its design, it almost looks like something out of a cartoon. This one looks like the Polar Express, and we could get lost walking around all these old trains. Oh yeah, model train, gotta love that. Check it out, this one has a camera mounted on it. Yep, that's me, waving. I knew there had to be more RVs. Here's a 1975 FMC motorhome. This one was used on the CBS News feature On the Road with Charles Curat, in which a three-man TV crew traveled on America's back roads. It was on the air for 25 years, and during that time they wore out six motorhomes. Bluebird school bus. I think you could build a pretty unique-looking schoolie out of that one. All right, let's go see the airplanes. Here we have something very interesting the Pitcairn PCA-2, an autogyro, also called a gyroplane or a gyrocopter. It is actually the predecessor to the modern helicopter. Here's what is said to be the first plane to reach the North Pole, which happened in 1926. Here they also have a replica of the Wright Brothers' 1903 flyer. The original is on display at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in Washington, which happens to be another one of my favorite museums. A DC-3! Those planes are awesome. 
Amazingly, some of them are still in use, and I would love to hitch a ride on one. Here they have a pretty large area dedicated to the civil rights movement. And at the center of it all, here we have Rosa Parks Bus, which has been restored as it would have looked in 1955. There's a docent inside giving a talk. 60 to 70% of the bus riders back then were black. That's why the whites... Why would this be at the center of an otherwise purely technological innovation museum? Well, the events that transpired in this bus are an example of cultural innovation. The seemingly simple act by Rosa Parks of refusing to give up her seat and getting arrested for it is what sparked the civil rights movement. Hard to fathom, this is the way it used to be in relatively recent history. There is also a section dedicated to women's rights. Changing the subject, I actually owned two of these models, the MicroTac and the StarTac. And up until the late 80s, all I had seen in person had been rotary phones. So I feel kind of old, but not that old. Here we go! Henry Ford's great innovation, the assembly line. Here's an example of a shoe factory in the 1890s. Hmm, I never knew Henry Ford was into violins. Here's a section on the evolution of furniture. There's a section on agriculture and being a city boy, I find this stuff fascinating. Here's a 1975 combine. And what is this doing here? This must belong to a different section, right? Look at this big contraption here. It is a steam tractor engine. One of these days, one of these days, I am going to make that farm to fork video, in which we're gonna figure out how all this stuff works. Of course, technology has advanced a bit. This kind of reminds me of the old carousel of progress in Disney World, and it shows what the same room would look like during different time periods. The first one was the 1700s, now we are in 1840. Things are getting a little better, but not much better, not quite yet anyways. In 1890 we have a better stove and what would be running water perhaps, or at least access to a well or something. And here we are, in the early 1930s. We have an icebox, electricity, and the kitchen sink looks very similar to the one I had in my boyhood home. Turning technology into furniture. Well, that's cool. Radios, television sets, record players. This area is called Mathematica, and it is an interactive exhibit to learn about math. Okay. Let's see what my place in time is. The place in time. They kind of have all the decades represented. Cool, the evolution of early TVs. Some of them still look like furniture. I think we are approaching my time period.
It is generally accepted that E.T. was one of the worst video games of all time. Let's check out the Dymaxion House, an environmentally efficient circular aluminum dwelling way ahead of its time when built in 1946. It looks kind of futuristic, even today. Like something you would see, perhaps, as part of the Earthship community in Taos, New Mexico. We've seen those. Last but not least, here we have all these big contraptions. It is a 200 kilowatt dynamo! So this place is massive and you could definitely spend a whole day here. I mean, just when I thought I had seen everything, there's this new section with steam engines. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, my time is kind of running out. This is called a cycloidal engine. Wouldn't it be cool to understand how all this stuff works? It is fascinating. Time's up! Right, massive museum here and um, let me tell you, you, you could spend, I mean, at least I could spend probably the whole day in there. There's so much to see and I kind of rushed through it. I saw almost everything but, um, but it would be nice just to you know, stand in front of each contraption there and just, you know, immerse yourself in the history. Definitely. It, it's way it's up there uh, with uh, with the Air and Space Museum, the, Smith, the Smithsonian. Uh, you know, top five, top top five of my favorite museums that you know that I've ever been. And they do that on the hour. They do like a like a oh, look at that Model T. Steam train. Oh, and in any, any case, as I was saying, and in here they also have uh, the, the, the the factory tour. The, the, there's so much you could, you could you could spend two or three days in this place, just in this Ford complex right here. So uh, we'll be back one of these days. They do have uh, ample RV parking, so. Well, what do you say we, we drive Minitini into Detroit? Must be some kind of tour, huh? More research shall go into this. For some time now, I've heard accounts that parts of Detroit have become kind of like a ghost town, with dilapidated buildings and abandoned factories, and while I'm not gonna be able to access all that with a trailer in tow, I want to find out how much of it is still true, because I've also heard the city is slowly coming back. 
It is plain to see. This part of town is in a little bit of disrepair. And this is the thing. Detroit went from a city of almost 2 million in the 1950s to 680,000 in 2015. So as you can imagine, a lot of it is abandoned. Yep, lots of abandoned buildings still here on Michigan Avenue. This is the Michigan Central Train Depot, which has been abandoned since 1988. The historic building, which is now owned by the Ford Motor Company, has been undergoing some renovations in recent years, and they do offer tours and have special events. The skyline has a certain Gotham City quality to it, doesn't it? Especially around the Penobscot building. I don't know, that was my first impression. Hmm, nice. There is certainly some gentrification happening around here. That's all the time we have. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna be late for my live stream tonight. But I mean, we we had to see uh, Detroit, right? Turn left onto Woodward Avenue. At least a little bit. I'm gonna be so late. Pretty cool because you can tell the city is doing a comeback. Still, a lot of um, yeah. I think here is where that zombie land building used to be. Uh, a, a lot of um, Fisher Service Drive, a lot of 75 SRV Road. Abandoned buildings around still, but a lot of gentrification too, and I guess that's good. You know, that's a good trend. Continue for three quarters of a mile. Time to say goodbye to Motor City. Barely knew ya, but we'll be back one of these days. Now, the rest of the day is going to be a pretty tedious drive. One which I'm not looking forward to. But it must be done. Ohio awaits. And that I am looking forward to. I'm going to spend some time with our friends the forest in vacation land. Particularly Putin Bay. And then a great meetup in Columbus, the state capital. But more about that on the next episode. Until then, thank you so much for watching. And see you on the road. Riding, riding